Hey guys, hello and welcome or welcome back to my channel. This is Shitich and on this channel we talk about robotics research in academia. You're watching the fifth lecture in the lecture series TT101 Basics of Mobile Robotics. And in today's lecture, we are going beyond sensing towards perception. We're going to do a quick recap of what we studied in the previous lecture and then look into a few perceptual pipelines and what are the various steps and that we do go through when we are perceiving an environment. And why would a robot want to do perception and what does it entail? And then we're gonna look into illusions, aliasing and synesthesia. As always, in case if you have missed any of the previous lectures, um, you might have some trouble understanding the contents of this lecture. So for your convenience, the entire playlist is linked in the I button above, and also the link to the playlist will be in the description box below. All the lectures inside the playlist are arranged in a chronological order. So in case if you've missed any of the previous lectures, be sure to watch them in a proper sequence. So let's get started with today's lecture. First, a quick recap of what we studied the last time. Previously, we discussed various types of sensors and their sensing capabilities. We did a brief overview of some sensing principles and the challenging, challenges with sensing. Now we're gonna look into perception. Let's start off understanding perception through an illustration. So what's shown in this figure on your screen? here perhaps you just see a blip mark on the screen which does not really tell you much does not make much sense to you so i will try to incrementally add more and more information for you until you're able to conclude something out of this so let's start with adding a few more strokes perhaps it still looks very abstract does not make much sense to you um, still looks as a bunch of blips on the screen how about now um, maybe it starts to look like a star, could be a doodle of a starfish, maybe two starfishes, or maybe to some people it still doesn't mean much. It's just an abstract bunch of strokes. So let's keep adding more information and more and more. So by this time, some of you might be able to guess what's on the screen. And if you do, pause the video and comment down below what do you see on the figure. And if you don't, I'll add a little bit more information and that's pretty much giving away what this is. And if you still didn't figure it out, it's a doodle of a bird. So what you did through this illustrative exercise is essentially what is perception. So let's define perception. Perception is the process of constructing an internal representation of the outside world when presented with a stimulus. So when I showed you the very first step of that illustration, where I told you there's a blip on the screen with a few strokes, that was me giving you a visual stimulus. And then when I was walking you through that illustration, that was you trying to build an internal representation of what you're seeing on the screen and what it could possibly mean. So perception is a top-down process where you're adding context to a stimuli based on your prior knowledge and what your sensor data is reporting to you. So essentially, as I said, you're trying to make some sense of what your sensors are telling you. And this is just, you know, you're being fed raw information and you're trying to go from that to something meaningful. One thing to note here is that since you are interpreting your stimuli by yourself to make an internal representation, it does not necessarily need to be accurate. In fact, it is usually never accurate. It's just your own um, representation in your own head. That's why it's called internal representation. So it's how you believe the outside world to look like. And that's why, you know, it's a doodle of a bird. But for instance, if I dig deeper, you still might not have any idea as to which bird's doodle is it, um, which region does it belong to, is it, does it hibernate, does it migrate? Um, and there are a lot more other questions that you possibly can't answer just based on the information that you saw so far, right? So it's just your interpretation which uh, works for this scenario, but it's not accurate, okay? And the, what you went through through that illustrative example could be laid out in a perceptual pipeline like this, where you start off with the raw sensing data, which is your stimulus that I presented to you. 
Then you do a little bit of signal processing and you extract some features out of it. And then you start interpreting what's in the scene and what your sensors are reporting. So you go from raw data to some scene interpretation and adding some context to what, what is around you. And we're going to look into each of these steps in a bit of a detail. And please note, we have already looked into the raw sensing data and what the sensors are capable of in the previous lecture. So we start off with a brief overview of, you know, sensing. What does it do? So sensing is a bottom of process, which relays an external stimuli as is, where a stimulus is defined as a detectable input from the environment. So let's say light, sound, pressure, balance, these are stimuli from an environment. And depending on which sensors you have on board, you might be able to sense some or all of these stimuli. And the sensors could be exteroceptive, interoceptive, working in active or passive modes, as we saw in the previous lecture. And the important part is they receive and relay raw information as is. There is no brain, no intelligence, no processing, no nothing. They just take and give it to you. Then comes the later steps of the pipeline where you start making some sense out of it and sanitize the data. And the way this works is via the process of transduction where you know the stimuli falls on your sensor and then it converts it from one form of energy into another. So for our biological senses, such as our eyes, our ears, our noses, this typically means that energy falls uh, from a stimulus onto the sensors and then it gets converted into a neural activity. And if you're talking about artificial sensors such as cameras or tactile sensors, then it would mean that a mechanical energy gets converted into electrical energy. And you should remember that typically this is how a sensor would see the environment. So when you have, you know, the stimulus is a measurable, identifiable quantity from the environment. So that would basically mean it's a real value um, mapping from a phenomena. So whatever it is that you're interested in observing, your sensor reports a real value from it. Um, it could be a Boolean value, it could be a matrix like this. And then, you know, the, the robot of the sensor has absolutely no idea what these values mean. Do they mean temperature? Do they mean pressure? Do they mean weight? Um, it has no concept of, you know, measurement units, kilograms, meters, etc. So it is through this perceptual pipeline that it's uh, you want to give some context to what is being observed. And once you you get the raw sensing data, you know, before you start making heads and tails of the data, you should do some sort of signal processing because Arguably, computation is very cheap these days. We are even making like very small form factor GPUs and TPUs for mobile robots too. Um, but it's a bit wasteful to process things that are, you, you know, like you're very confident that makes absolutely no sense for you. So for instance, you, have, you might have outliers in your data, which means, you know, if you have some sort of prior understanding of the environment in which you're in. So for instance, if you're, in a cold storage measuring, let's say, the, the temperature inside so that whatever is stored in there stays fresh. And suddenly the thermometer reports temperatures like plus 50 degrees Celsius or plus 80 degrees Celsius or something, you know those are outliers in the sensor is giving you some noisy data because it's a cold storage. It's never supposed to be plus 50. And especially if the data is sporadic, you know those are outliers and you can prune them easily. Similarly, you could detrend the data. So if you have prior information that you know the data might have some trends or some correlations and you could detrend it by removing the mean, et cetera. Um, you could condition it by passing it through some filters, adding some thresholding, quantize the data, compress the data, which is very commonly used for um, computer vision and image processing. So depending on what is it that you want to do with the image you've captured, you may not necessarily need to process a very ultra high definition image, right? So you could compress it to a grayscale. Maybe that's enough for you to make sense of what's in the image and, and process it and come up with the results you intend to get. So as I say, signal processing, sometimes even referred to as pre-processing is the basic sanitization of the data to prepare it for you know, making context and processing down the perceptual pipeline. So once you've cleaned up the data and you've prepared it for processing, as I said, the, the robots and the sensors, they don't really know what that data is. They just report some real valued numbers. So they, they need to make some sense of what's inside the data. And that is typically done through feature extraction. So feature is a measurable property that describes the data, sometimes also called as an input. 
So if you want an example, then for an image that could mean pixel, edge, corner, texture, uh, for an audio could be signal to noise ratio, length of sounds, et cetera. And they start to represent what's inside the sensed raw data that you have and, and sort of like a representation of that data. So you want once you've extracted and identified what features you, you have in the data, you want them to be represented. So for instance, if you have an edge for an image, um, you want to be able to represent it. So it could have N number of representations. You could represent it as a vector. Um, you could with a starting point and an angle or a vector with a length and a, a direction, or could be a matrix of values, or could be a start point and the end point of the edges or it could be like a binary value where the gradient of intensity changes. There are different ways of representing what an edge means and you need to figure out what that representation would be for you. And the same way for other features that you might have for the data you're sensing. And once you've, um, you know, you, once you're deciding these representations, you need to keep in mind that the level of detail is critical because the higher the complexity of uh, the representation of the feature, the more information you can capture with respect to what's inside the data and you know describing the data. But it might incur heavier computation. And in case if you're interested in real-time performance guarantees, you still have a trade-off of uh, you know you're processing unnecessary data or you're adding unnecessary computation complexities to your uh, processing pipeline. Then that might be a bottleneck down the line. So. Um, you need to be careful with, uh, you know, how you're representing, so low-level representations of your of your data. And um, so now it's time to introduce pop quizzes for this lecture. And as before, all pop quizzes are numbered. And if you want to answer them, which I'm hoping you do, um, please refer to the pop quiz number when you're addressing them. And feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below. And you're also welcome to join our Discord community, the link to which will be in the description box below. Um, and feel free to do an active engagement with the rest of the community there and discuss these pop quizzes. And uh, you know, the Discord server even allows you to upload some images, et cetera, in case if you want to get creative and add illustrations to support your arguments. So the first thing for you is to figure out, you know, we talked about features and feature representations, but uh, what you what should have come to your mind already, if not, was uh, what qualifies as a good feature for a particular task? And do you handcraft your features or is there some sort of like an algorithmic method to uh, do some sort of machine learning and you know the, the machine learning approach tells you what features there are in your data? So we would refer to them as handcrafted versus machine learned features. Building onto the discussion, um, since there are broadly speaking two ways of coming up with features, of course, there are then arguments that you could have hybrid features where you come up with some handcrafted features and there are some machine learned features. So you have like a whole um, bag of features, et cetera. But let's not get into those kind of things. But what do you think happens when you use handcrafted features versus machine learned features? And also um, different sensory stimuli uh, could have different features, just like for an image we discussed, there could be edges, there could be pixels, there could be textures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so does it suffice to just have one feature at a time or could you stack multiple features or do you even want to stack multiple features? So these are just kind of food for thought for you guys to start thinking and brainstorming about the relevance of um, features and the representations. And then, um, sure, uh, we talked about a few different examples for audiovisual uh, pipelines, um, sensory stimuli, and how their uh, features would look like. So it is, uh, remember that we talked about these biometric rat-inspired whisker sensors in the previous lecture. So what would be some useful touch features if you want to use a sensor like this for navigation with a mobile robot? Okay. So we've looked into, you know, um, getting the raw sensory data, then uh, doing some sanitization via signal processing techniques, then extracting some features and understanding what the data is all about. And then the last step of the perceptual pipeline is to try and interpret what's in the scene. Um, scene could include a lot of different things. Uh, what the, basically think of it as the environment in which the robot is in. Uh, 
So um, some examples of scene interpretation could be, you know, semantic understanding. So in this example, you're seeing uh, the robot is trying to label what's around it. So imagine you have a snapshot through your camera. Um, it's trying to understand, okay, there's a chair, there is a person, there's another person, there's a person there, there's another chair here. Um, then you could, you know, incrementally build on top of this understanding. So if there are chairs, tables, and person, more than one person in an environment, maybe you are in an office room um, because of the office furniture, etc. So this is all uh, semantic understanding. Um, sometimes maybe you're not interested in the semantics, but more in the geometric representations of what's the geometry of the environment you're in. So in which case you might be interested in things like edges and corners. So here I'm drawing some edges, um, which you could easily detect with some edge detection filters and having a camera. And you're trying to see, okay, there are legs of a chair here. There are the edges of the column or the pillar of the wall, um, tables, frames, windows, etc. Then if you have a robot here, you can start to reason. If I go forward, then I might bang into this um, column inside the office room. Maybe if I turn left, then I end up going under the table, um, assuming there is a sensor capable of detecting under the table. Um, then is it safe to be there? Perhaps if you're a vacuum cleaning robot, then it is. Perhaps if you're just a delivery robot, maybe it isn't. Um, if you turn right, then there seems to be a lot of free space and so you can safely navigate, etc. So you're interpreting, you know, what's around you, what is it that you can and cannot do as a robot with the sensors you have on board. Additional things that could happen is, you know, so if you, depending on how well your decision making and reasoning skills are in terms of AI and, and the computation processes you have on board, you might be able to interpret things like, okay, so there are people talking, this is an office environment, maybe they're having a discussion, maybe the discussion might end soon, uh, maybe this person might get up and start walking, in which case they become a dynamic obstacle, so you have to be careful that when you're moving, um, they, they might be moving, so you don't want to end up colliding with them, etc. So all of these things become possible when you have the ability to perceive the environment through the sensors you have on board. Let's look at the perceptual pipeline for a few of the most uh, well-studied bioreceptors. So the first one is obviously going to be the visual pipeline through our eyesight. Um, basically, the light bounces off an object of interest and enters the eye through the cornea. And then the iris and the pupil, they control the amount of light entering in and falling on the retina, which has about 130 million photoreceptors for um, this light energy to be transduced into an electrical impulse or a neural activity. And through these optic nerves, um, they are then transferred into various parts of the brain and the different centers in the brain then process different parts of this information. So they could be detecting edges or faces or colors. Um, or some other information. So, you know, there are different centers capable of finding different types of information inside um, this visual stimuli. And um, the question for you then is, you know, if one eye could help visually perceive the environment, why do we have two eyes? And if you want to make it more challenging for you, the question then further builds on that both the eyes are not in the same spot, right? So if one eye would have sufficed, we would have exactly one eye in the center, but there might be a reason why we have two eyes that are slightly offset from each other. So try and um, relate this to the visual pipeline that you just saw. And the hint for you is to think about the amount of the kind of information that you could process with one eye and what additional things could happen if you had two eyes. Next, we look into the auditory pipeline. So just like the visual pipeline, then you have a sound source, could be a musical instrument, could be a person talking such as myself, um, where their audio signals generate pressure waves in the air, which fall onto your outer ear and then through the ear canal gets transferred to your um, eardrum. And uh, as the membrane of the eardrum vibrates under this pressure, it then goes to the cochlea. And then inside that, there is this um, fluid, which also gives you a sense of balance. So if you move your head too much, or if you have motion sickness or something, it has to do with uh, this fluid and giving you a sense of stability. And inside this fluid, there are hair bundles, which are auditory receptors, just like we have visual receptors. And then they transduce this pressure waves into uh, neural signals, which then go into the brain via the auditory nerve. 
And then you're able to interpret what this pressure wave was all about, the loudness, the pitch, uh, was it somebody speaking? If so, what was the, the content about? What language was it? Um, or was it somebody singing? What musical notes was it, et cetera? Or some instrument, then what, what was it? And so on. Similar to the visual pipeline, the question for you is if one year could have helped achieve all of this auditory stimuli through, through from start to finish, um, why do we have two years? And then a brain teaser for you. So we have looked into the audiovisual pipelines and they are by far the most well-studied um, tactile uh, pipelines for um, sensory pipelines and especially in humans. Can you explain what a tactile pipeline would look like for human fingers? So we are able to touch and perceive the environment and we get different kinds of stimuli. So uh, we are able to grab things, we are able to feel the temperature of things. Um, what would the pipeline for something like that look like? And then you could expand on this pipeline. Um, I am assuming that for human fingers, the literature is very uh, easy to find, but then you can build on that and figure out so if we had a rad whisker like sensor, which is also another sort of touch sensor, but now you want to navigate, so move around in an environment, how would the perceptual pipeline look like for something like that? Okay, now comes the million dollar question. What is it that the robot can do once it's able to perceive the environment? So we'll narrow it down and the answer is spatial perception. So it is able to understand the environment that is around it and then make decisions. So it can identify things like free spaces and obstacles using sensors like a lidar. It can look for dynamic obstacles such as pedestrians or in the office setting, as I said, the person might just stand up and start walking. And not just the scene geometry and semantics, there are various different kinds of maps um, that could be built out of it. So let's look into various types of spatial maps. Um, so I'll go back to this properties of maps in just a second. Um, first, look, let's look into various kinds of spatial maps. So um, this first map is basically a landmark map. So you, let's say I give you these kind of corners and you're only interested in these corners. It's sorts of landmarks, which are, let's say, unique identifiable places for you. Or maybe let's say at these corners, I have something special, maybe a sticky note, maybe a color patch, or maybe something that makes it unique and identifiable for you as a robot. And you only keep the information of these corners. Um, another thing could be a polygon or a segment map, in which case you represent the obstacles as some sort of polygons. And um, you have a, let's say a laser scanner, which is reporting a bunch of uh, laser points on the environment, but you could even represent these as like line segments. So you start connecting them if you want to be fancy. Um, you could have an occupancy map. So in case if you have a discretize the world as a grid and each of these grid, you could mark them as black, which is occupied. So it's not free for you to be in. Uh, mark them as white, which means it's free for you to be in. Mark them as gray, which means you have no idea what's there because you haven't observed it yet. Um, or it could be a topological map, in which case you're not interested in the scene geometry anymore. You're just interested in you know, the relationships between the things in the environment. So maybe uh, you have a room here, to the right you have a door, after the door you have a junction, to the bottom of the junction you have another junction, they are connected with the corridor. So you're kind of making relationships between the things in the environment, what is to the right, what is to the left, what's in front, what's behind, what's above, what's below, and so on. Um, you could even have a measurement map like this. Um, for instance, imagine this is like a Wi-Fi router on a wall. And remember we talked about received signal strength as one of the methods of understanding the sensor data and receiving sensor data. So the Wi-Fi signal strength would be the strongest near the router, which is the source of the signal. So it's shown in green and it decays and attenuates as you go farther away from it, especially as it has to penetrate through obstacles such as walls. And you know when it's uh, red, that means it's the least um, signal strength you would receive at that point in the environment. So there are different kinds of spatial maps one could make when you are able to perceive and interpret what's in the scene. And now we come back here, which are the desirable properties, right? So when you're talking about maps, irrespective of you know what kind of map you're making, um, you would want to have some identifiable elements, could be landmarks, could be 
unique uh, signal strengths or something that help you make some sense of you know where on the map you are and um, so information about some obstacles. So if you are using Google Maps and you're driving, then you get information about roadblocks, traffic congestions, diversions, for instance, um, alternative routes, and and these kind of information are very useful for you. So you could you know while you're going from one place to another, you're able to adapt and improvise accordingly. And they should be scalable. So maybe I'm looking at my own neighborhood. So maybe I'm making a measurement map within my own office room. Uh, maybe I'm doing it for the whole building. Maybe I'm doing it for the whole city, country, whatever. So as I grow the scale of the map, it should not go out of hand in terms of you know being able to process that information and, and making decisions based on it. And key thing to note here is there should be connections between various things. So you saw the topological map here, right? So if I just told you this junction was to the right of this and this junction was to the right of this, but there was no connection between them, that's just disjoint information. Right? So if you go from here to here, you'd have no idea how you go from there to, for instance, in the kitchen, if that's where I wanted to go. So you need some sort of connectivity on the map and the ability to compute on the map, okay? And aside from the map, so that was assuming that you were, um, you know, only under, you know where you are, you just want to understand, you know, how does the map of the environment looks like, could be different kinds of maps. Now this is the reverse case where, uh, you know, imagine you were given a tourist map of a city that you're just visiting. So you have uh, some landmarks given to you. Maybe you have a castle, maybe you have a bank, maybe you have uh, some other forts, et cetera, that are like key tourist places to visit there. And you have a walking circuit given to you, but you don't know where you are. So you just landed, you just checked, in, checked into your hotel or hostel, and now you have to figure out, okay, where on the map are you? which is basically known as the concept of localization, which means you're estimating the robot's pose, position and orientation with respect to an absolute frame given a map, okay? And once you know where you are um, and you have an understanding of where you want to go, which means you know your current location and your goal, you are able to plan the path because you have a map in front of you. And if it fulfills all the desirable properties, you're able to figure out where you're going. And then it depends, you know, your map may report dynamic obstacles, scene objects, uh, landmarks, obstructions, etc. So the first case with the spatial perception, you were able to make a map. The second case, you're able to localize yourself with respect to a given map. The third case is you could simultaneously localize yourself while building a map. And this is known as SLAM for short. And this is often a chicken and egg problem because imagine, right, you, you are just Say you go to a new city, you've never been there before, so everything is unknown for you. You don't have a map. Um, you don't speak the language. You don't know where you are. To know where you are, you need a map. But to need a map, you need to know where you are. So that's why it becomes a chicken and egg problem. And this needs to be solved iteratively because you know your sensor has a limited sensing radius around it. So when you are in an environment, your sensors turn on, you start to observe partial environment. Within that partial observation, you start to localize, okay, with respect to this much amount of map that I know where I am, where I am. Then you take an action, you move somewhere, then you observe a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. So you're incrementally building a map while localizing yourself with respect to the map that you have at the time. So this is a very high level overview of what spatial perception would look like. And in the coming lecture, we're gonna look into uh, SLAM and state estimation. So you're gonna get into a lot of detail of how this process works and what it entails. Now, okay, let's, let's try and understand, okay, why spatial perception? So one example I have been using all this time is to point to point navigation. So if I know my current location, I know my goal pose, and if I have a map that is connected and allows me to compute over it, I can design a path to go from point A to point B. But what kind of mobile robot task do you think one could achieve if you have a functional spatial perception pipeline? So other than a point to point navigation scenario, this is for you to brainstorm and uh, come up with some answers um, in the comment section below. Okay, so spatial perception, you know, as I said, it's a matter of interpretation of your stimuli and it's your own internal representation, which means it is written with a few problems. Now, the first problem we're gonna talk about is illusions. 
Basically, this means sensor may deceive you, and for the same sensor stimuli, you might end up with different interpretations. So, in this figure shown on the left here, do you see a rabbit or a duck? This is for you to uh, interpret, and your interpretation would be biased on your past experiences. So let's see how many people vote for a rabbit, how many people vote for a duck um, in the comment section below. Similarly, if you visited a barber shop, a uh, barber's pole is a very common sign of, for you to localize where the barber shop is, right? So it's a, let's say it's a landmark uh, that basically gives away that's a barber shop, but there's an illusion. Even though this pole is spinning in place and it's technically fixed because of the, the way the spiral is arranged, it feels like it's going upwards, even if it isn't going anywhere. That's another illusion. And the question for you here is, what according to you is the correlation between perception and illusion? In other words, can you figure out what is causing these kind of illusions? Also, tear at this figure for a minute or so, and then can you count the number of black dots that you have on this scintillating grid? Then again, stare at this figure for a minute and then comment down below whether this is a static image or an animation. Would be very interesting. The longer you stare at it, the more um, confused you're gonna get with your own answer. So uh, spend a minute or so looking at it before you're sure you know what the answer is. And then look at this figure for a minute or so and then figure out whether you see two white faces or a vase, vase or vase, however you pronounce it, you know, the, the flower pot. So whether you see two faces or a vase, this is another illusion. While all of the previous ones were visual illusions, there are also these funny audio illusions that I like to call them. So if you look up, YouTube or some other app, I'm sure you're gonna find a lot of these parody and memes of misheard lyrics where people are kind of coming up with uh, these kind of misheard lyrics. And once they type it out on the screen, you find it real hard to figure out what the actual words of this or the lyrics of the song were. And look up any of these uh, videos and, and you would be so confused as to what these lyrics were that you thought they were. And what once the people say, no, it meant this, in the misheard context, uh, you would find it real hard to just unhear all of that and go back to the original lyrics. So that's an auditory illusion. Another thing that you should know about uh, spatial perception and, and perception in general is the concept of illusions, um, which we just looked into, and then aliasing. Aliasing means when two or more signals become indistinguishable, uh, in other words, aliased, and they could be spatially aliased or temporarily aliased. So in the context of signal processing, aliasing basically renders some artifacts. And this refers to, you know, when you're sampling the signal at too low a frequency. So you're subsampling, in which case you basically get reconstruction errors where your reconstructed signal is different from the original. Um, but in our context, I'll give you some examples as to what I mean by aliasing. So first we look into uh, visual aliasing. A visually aliased scene would typically look something like this, where you know there are a bunch of, let's say, pine trees or whatever trees that grow parallelly and thin stems inside in one of the forests, and then you see a similar scene in the other forest. Now, ignore for a moment that the ground is a bit different and the illumination is a bit different. Uh, let's just say if the robot is just looking at the tree, kind of is the field of view of uh, the robot and the camera in both the cases, it would be a bit confused whether it's in the same forest or it's a different forest now or some other patch of the same forest. So th these are visually aliased scenes which the robot and the camera would get confused. Same way there could be tactile aliasing in which case you might be touching two different trees, but they might feel the same. So if you want to localize yourself with respect to the touch of a tree in a particular forest, you might struggle real hard because, you know, assume that I let you touch a tree in one forest, then I teleport you to another forest, another tree where you touch it, but it feels the same and you're blindfolded at all this time. So you have no idea that you got teleported. You would find it really hard to figure out whether it's the same tree, different tree, same forest, different forest, uh, just based on touch feedback. And that's tactile aliasing. And then audio aliasing, um, basically I like to use this example where, you know, there are a lot of these talent hunt shows where people try uh, try to 
um, do some impressions or sound alikes for the more popular personalities such as some singers etc and that basically if you close your eyes and you listen to them and you will start to imagine that it's the actual singer that's singing the song but these are just sound alikes so you could consider them as audio aliasing where you can't really distinguish between the original singer and the person trying to do an impression of them so question for you is perceptual aliasing and illusion And with that, we move to the last segment of this lecture, which is synesthesia. So synesthesia is actually a neurological disorder, which is very rare and very harmless. And it basically renders crossover in the senses. So if you come from sensors and signal processing domain, you would have heard about signal crosstalk or sensor crosstalk. And basically what this means is that activity in one sensory modality invokes an involuntary experience in another even if that sensor was not stimulated. So for instance, um, if you see somebody else being touched, you get a tactile sensation as well. Or if uh, you, you basically start getting a taste for a certain texture, even if you're just looking at the texture, you start to get a taste. So this is like the crossover of the senses where one sensor is being stimulated, but the other gets involuntary, some uh, perceptual experience, even if, um, the other one was being stimulated. So again, is synesthesia an illusion? And can you think of a scenario where, you know, of course, synesthesia doesn't happen in, uh, in, in a robot and in the artificial world because it's a neurological disorder. But for the sake of the argument, let's just say that we could engineer and artificially induce a synesthesia in a robot with a bunch of sensors. Can you think of a scenario where doing something like this would actually be beneficial for a mobile robot um, that is deployed in an unknown environment? So um, these were some of the brain teasers for you. And I hope uh, through this lecture, you got an understanding of you know, the entire perceptual pipeline. And we looked at a few of the most prominent perceptual pipelines, the audiovisual pipelines. And you get a sense of you know, how the data goes from a raw sensory data to allowing you to make some interpretation of what's in the scene. If you found this lecture useful, be sure to like and leave a comment or a feedback for me in the comment section below and share it with the fellow learners who are just getting started with robotics and want to get familiar with the various concepts. And be sure to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell notification so that you're notified as soon as the next lecture goes live. And with that, I hope you have a nice day, stay safe and see you next time.